I, um, my, with my former PhD student, Christina Larkin, because I'll pre be presenting um, some of the results from her PhD, which we just uh, published last week. Unfortunately, Christina Larkin's um, moving house at the moment, um, so, she reached, so she couldn't join us this evening. Um, uh, but I will give you an idea about why we are looking at um, ocean circulation changes, how that links to climate, how we reconstruct ocean circulation, um, and then talk about this new study uh, that Christina and I have published on the, on the Norwegian Sea, the Nordic Seas, and why they're critical for understanding um, the role uh, of ocean circulation in climate change. So I'd like to begin by looking at um, this schematic of the ocean circulation system. Okay, and it, it looks a bit like a conveyor belt. And so you can kind of think of this conveyor belt as shuffling water around between um, the different ocean basins in the globe. Um, the, the orange arrows here are the surface ocean currents um, in the Atlantic, Indian Ocean, and Pacific. Um, you might be familiar with the Gulf Stream, which is here in the North Atlantic. That orange arrow is basically the Gulf Stream, which brings um, warm waters to the north. Um, the circles is where these surface waters sink into the ocean interior, and they flow through the deep ocean along these blue arrows. So you can find that the deep ocean circulates in the North Atlantic to the South Atlantic, around Antarctica, into the Indian Ocean. Um, and into the Pacific Ocean, um, where those deep waters come back up to the surface again. So it's really like a conveyor belt um, that, that moves um, waters with differing temperatures and salinities um, around the planet. And basically, we'll see how that affects um, climate. So to understand why these waters sink from the surface ocean into the deep ocean, um, we need to understand what makes those waters dense, okay? And what, what basically makes them dense is low temperature and high salinity. So this map that I'm showing at the top is a map of uh, sea surface temperatures. So the red areas are areas where it would be great to take a holiday, especially this time of year as things are getting colder. Um, those, that's where we have the warmest temperatures in the world. You could see that the polar regions are where we have cold waters, okay? We can also see on the bottom map what the sea surface salinity is. And you could see that in the middle of the ocean basins, especially these ocean gyres, um, are where we have the highest salinity. And in fact, the Gulf Stream has both warm waters and also high, high salinity waters as it flows northwards um, to near Iceland and Greenland and Scandinavia. Um, and so basically, if you put together temperature and salinity, um, you get the density of those surface waters. And so we could see that um, this area where the Gulf Stream has moved these um, these, these um, salty waters, which have now cooled down, um, they become both cold and salty and therefore dense. Okay, and likewise around Antarctica, where we have a lot of brines being produced um, when we form sea ice, we also have very saline and cold waters and therefore dense. Um, so the regions in this map where you have very red waters, is where you have dense surface waters. And those waters will therefore sink from the surface ocean into the deep ocean by a process known as convection. And so yes, in our example, the Gulf Stream is really important. It's bringing these warm, salty waters northwards where they're cooling down and they're effectively releasing that heat that they're carrying to the atmosphere. And they're releasing it over areas like Britain and Scandinavia um, and that, imparts a warmer air temperature in those regions than um, areas of, uh, you know, of, of similar latitudes, say Alaska um, and Northern Canada, okay? And that really stabilizes climate in, in this region and makes it warmer than it otherwise would be. So let's imagine if we could um, bisect or dissect this, um, this ocean basically and, and turn it on its side and look at what the water mass, what the water masses look like 
from the surface into the deep ocean. Okay, so let's turn it on its side now. Um, and this is a plot I'll be showing throughout the talk. Um, the, the top of the of this plot is the is the sea surface, okay, zero depth. Um, to the right, we have north, and to the south, uh, to the left, we have south, the equator someplace in the middle here, okay. Um, and so the Gulf Stream is this arrow that's basically moving waters from the equator up to the top right, where we have Nordic seas here. That's where those waters become dense and they sink into the, into the depths of the ocean. Okay, they flow past Iceland, which is this bit of gray here. And in fact, all along the bottom of this plot at about four to five kilometers depth in the ocean is the bottom of the ocean. Right, and that gray is all the sea mounts and the mid-ocean ridges. Um, that's basically would be found at the bottom of the ocean. Okay, um, so that's that's the, the the depths of the ocean. Over here on this side is Antarctica. Okay, and so what we're looking at is how the ocean circulates in an interior view. The Gulf Stream brings these um, waters to the north. They sink and then they flow out into the open Atlantic at about three to four kilometers depth. We also have waters around Antarctica, which sink as well, and they flow northwards, and then both of these water masses upwell um, in the southern hemisphere. So if we are taking these warm waters and they're releasing their heat to the atmosphere and be, before they become dense, um, that releases heat to the North Atlantic. And that's one way that ocean circulation can affect climate. The other way is by storing carbon in the deep ocean. Um, it turns out that for a parcel of water to circulate um, from where it forms near the Nordic seas um, to the Southern Ocean around Antarctica uh, takes about 500 to 700 years. So it, um, the, uh, the water masses are sitting down here in the deep ocean for a long period of time. And if you see pictures of the deep ocean, um, so this is from a submersible to the left, you could see all this kind of like snow, these little particles which are drifting down through the water column. To the right is a sampler um, that was put at the bottom of the ocean um, to collect some of that material. You could also see it's really foggy down there. And that's because um, there's matter which is continuously raining down from the surface ocean into the deep ocean, okay? And if we looked at what that sample is collecting um, what, uh, under a microscope, this is what we'd see. So it's basically bits of organic matter um, and fecal pellets, right? This is organic matter that's coming from the surface ocean where we have a lot of biological activity, where we have life, okay? And this material after it dies, drops into the deep ocean, thousands uh, of, of meters in depth, okay? And it's, it's effectively carrying carbon into the deep ocean. If we look at some of the contents within this organic matter, that's phytoplankton, coccoliths, diatoms. These are, uh, are basically um, pieces of, um, these are organisms and pieces of organisms, okay? So this is um, the ocean's way of sequestering and storing carbon. It's taking it out of the atmosphere via life, putting it into the deep ocean for hundreds, perhaps, uh, thousands to millions of years um, if this organic matter is sedimented um, and covered over in the deep ocean. So in a sense, the overturning rate of the ocean is doing two things. It's transporting heat um, in the surface ocean, these orange arrows. Okay, and then the deep ocean where, the, where you see these blue arrows, it's storing CO2. Okay, and the longer these water masses sit down there, the more carbon they accumulate um, from this uh, dead biological material that's raining down into it. Um, and if we speed up ocean circulation, then that carbon can be brought back up to the surface um, and released to the atmosphere. And obviously CO2 is a greenhouse gas. Uh, so if we change the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere relative to the amount that's stored into the ocean, we also change global climate. So how can we examine um, the link between um, ocean circulation changes and climate? 
Well, one way we can do that is modeling. Um, there's um, a lot of physical and mathematical models which can look at fluid dynamics of ocean circulation and can uh, model how heat transport occurs and even how CO2 is stored in the deep ocean. Um, we can also take modern measurements, and these modern measurements help inform our modeling. Um, we can measure temperature and salinity and carbon and the chemistry of seawater today. Um, however, if we're really trying to understand really big changes in the climate system, uh, for example, what happens if you melt an ice sheet, the only way to really do that is to, um, to, to look in the past and to, to look at periods of times when ice, ice sheets melted and then observe their, um, the effects that they had on the ocean circulation system. And so that's what I'll be talking about um, in the rest of this talk, how we do that. And so the way that we empirically can reconstruct the history of ocean circulation is to measure mud from the bottom of the ocean. And this is a picture of, of, of cores that um, we took on an uh, expedition off of, um, off of Svalbard, which is um, in the Nordic Seas. Okay, and it's basically a hollow metal tube that's um, lowered on, uh, uh, from a winch on the ship down to the bottom of the ocean, and then it's um, allowed to drop into the sediment, and the sediment um, basically fills up that tube. Um, and that gives us a record of the sediments that had been deposited over thousands of years. When we split those core open, um, as we've done here in this uh, laboratory on board the ship, you can even see some of the layering within the mud. Um, so the, the, the mud at top here is, is a lighter color. It gets a bit more brown, a bit more lighter. There's some layers that might even be um, drop stones from icebergs and such. Um, so, so basically, the sediment that we collect from the bottom of the ocean can be thought of as, um, as pages in a book. And, you know, the, the, the oldest sediment is at the bottom, the youngest on the top. And if we, can, um, if we can read that book, we have a history of what happened in the oceans and also what happened in climate too. Um, but the writing in the book is, um, is what we need to decipher. Um, what's the ink in the book um, that tells us about ocean circulation? And in our case, we use a chemical um, to, to tell us about these past changes. And the chemical that we use is um, an element called neodymium, and it's located at the bottom of the periodic table down here in this series of elements called the rare earth elements. You probably heard about them, um, their use in technology such as lasers and, um, and, and, and speakers and headphones and such. And they're very rare elements in the ocean. And that's actually what makes them really useful because um, they're not, active biologically. And so they don't change in the ocean. In a sense, they act like a dye, such as you might add dye to, um, to a swimming pool or a bathtub, and that dye just gets carried along uh, because it's not involved in the processes, the biological and the physical and chemical processes that happen in the ocean. Um, so what we actually measure is the neodymium isotope ratio um, of neodymium in the ocean. Uh, there's two neodymium isotopes, neodymium-143 and neodymium-144. And the neodymium-143 isotope is produced by another rare earth element, an isotope called samarium-147. And it's produced by radioactive decay. Um, so with a half-life of 106 billion years, 147 samarium decays to produce neodymium-143. Uh, so why is that useful? So the earth as a whole, if we can imagine, if we took the earth and we put it into a blender, okay, and we, we took a sample of it, um, that, that whole earth has been evolving through time, through geological time, um, due to the decay of Samarium-147 to Neodymium-143. When the earth formed 4.56 billion years ago, it had a lower amount of neodymium-143 than it has today. Um, during the last four and a half billion years, we've been growing in the amount of neodymium-143 through time. 
Um, so it's, it's basically telling us about the ages of the rocks. And it turns out that rocks deep, at the, deep inside the earth, uh, rocks which are volcanic, um, have a higher amount of samarium relative to neodymium. So they grow in this neodymium-143 at a faster rate than the bulk earth. Um, and rocks uh, in, in the crust, um, like granites, for example, have a lower amount of samaria th than neodymium, and therefore it grows in neodymium-143 at a slower rate. And so what this gives us is, is variability. Um, in different rocks due to their age and due to where they come from, okay? Um, so in a sense, this technique first was used to date rocks. It effectively tells us about how old the rocks are and whether they're volcanic or whether they're, um, they're from the ancient crust. Um, but we're using it differently than that. If we map out the neodymium isotopic compositions of rocks on the planet, okay, um, which is shown here in different colors, um, you can see they have a different neodymium isotopic composition because they have different ages um, and they come from different processes. So for example, if we look at around the Pacific, the Pacific Ring of Fire, which is, um, has lots of volcanic rocks, which are very young, they have a neodymium isotopic composition, which is quite high and it's colored red in this picture. Iceland also, has a very red composition, okay? Um, Greenland and Northern Canada, parts of Australia, parts of Africa are very old crust and therefore they have a much lower or bluer neodymium isotopic composition. Um, so in a sense, this is telling us about the ages of the rocks, but what happens during weathering is that the neodymium comes out of the rock. Um, it goes into the rivers, it goes into seawater, um, and it enters the ocean. And it basically, the different colors of these rocks, so there are different neodymium isotopes, label the water masses. So let's return to this picture again of, of a side profile view of how the Atlantic Ocean overturns. Uh, we can see that the Gulf Stream waters sink in the Nordic Seas and then they flow out into the deep Atlantic Ocean. Um, and then we have Antarctic waters in the southern part in the depths of the ocean. What we can see when we look at the neodymium isotopes for waters looks something like this. So you could see that we, if we measure actual seawater samples from different depths in the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic and we measure their neodymium isotopes, there's blue waters up here in the North. Um, those have a very low neodymium uh, composition. Um, there's greener waters in the south, which have a higher neodymium isotopic composition. And you could see that, it, that the pattern basically follows the circulation of the water masses. So I'll show that again. You can kind of see that um, as the currents move southwards, they smear that blue water mass towards the south. The green water mass is carried by the Antarctic source water. So it really does act like a dye uh, that's tracing um, these different currents as they move through the ocean interior. That neodymium gets incorporated into the sediment um, as it's deposited on the seafloor, and we can then um, we can then sample those cores. Um, and here, here we are taking samples um, from the top of a core downwards, little cubes of mud. Um, and we know the ages of these uh, of when that sediment was deposited. Uh, so therefore, if we can extract the neodymium isotopes from that sediment, we can then measure its composition. And it tells us what the ocean was circulating like uh, during that period of time. So how do we do that? Um, well, we do this in the chemistry lab. Um, we either um, use acid uh, and reducing agents to leach out um, iron and manganese oxides, which have encapsulated the neodymium isotopic composition of seawater uh, when they were deposited, or we can measure them on, on calcite organisms. So the shells of, of foraminifera, which were living at the time, um, we can measure the neodymium isotopic composition uh, of them as well. And they tell us um, the neodymium isotopic composition of the seawater in which they were living. 
So in a way, we're using uh, chemistry to tell us about the physics, uh, the physical circulation of the ocean. Uh, because we can't measure the physics directly in the past, uh, but the chemistry, in a sense, acts as a tracer of, of what the ocean was physically doing. Now, in order to measure the neodymium isotopes, uh, we not only have to extract it from the sediment, but we also have to purify it. Um, this, is, this shows a picture of what our, our lab looks like. It looks like any chemistry lab that you'd find in the university. Here we're using a technique called chromatography uh, to separate out um, neodymium from the other elements um, that we can extract from the sediment. Okay, and then uh, once we've purified the neodymium, uh, we, we load it onto um, a mass spectrometer, which then can measure its isotope ratio, okay? So in a sense, what we've done is we've gone from mud um, to, to neodymium, pure neodymium, to then measuring its isotope ratio um, to, get, to get those measurements. And it's a long process. Um, but it, it really is one of the, the only ways that we could measure what the ocean circulation was doing um, in the past. Okay, so let's have a big picture look at what um, the ocean was uh, circulation looked like during the, um, during the last ice age, okay? Um, so here's a picture of our ocean circulation system again. Um, this is a study by my um, previous PhD student, Jake Howe, um, from in, in 2016, where he measured neodymium isotopes throughout the whole Atlantic Ocean. Okay, and so what we're seeing here, uh, again, is, is that, that plume of North Atlantic waters being carried southwards to Antarctica at about three um, kilometers depth. Okay, and so that's the, that's the measurements we made of the, of the modern ocean and the modern sediments. This is what um, it looks like if we, um, if we took, when we took sediment from 20,000 years ago, when we were at the height of the last ice age or the last glacial maximum. Okay, and what we could see is that it's, a, it's a quite a different picture. We don't see as much blue. Um, we do see um, some of this North Atlantic water um, with the low neodymium, that's colored blue, but instead of extending all the way to the bottom of the ocean and flowing all the way south to Antarctica at around three kilometers, it's much shallower, it's about two kilometers depth. Um, it's still flowing quite far south, but much of the deep ocean is filled up with a water mass which has a neodymium isotopic composition uh, that's very red or um, much higher in composition, higher than any water mass that we see today, and that's flowing from south to north um, and filling the abyss of the ocean. So it seems like the mixing between those water masses, instead of uh, happening in the South Atlantic like today, was happening somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic uh, at about two and a half kilometers depth. So that's kind of the big picture changes um, that we can see that have happened between the last ice age at about 20,000 years ago and today. Um, what I'd like to spend the rest of the talk talking about is how we go from that circulation during the glacial period um, to, um, to today. Because at that time period, when we transitioned from an ice age to the modern climate, we melted a lot of ice sheets. And uh, especially they were melting in the North Atlantic around the Nordic Seas. And so we want to understand, you know, what happens um, at the formation sites of the deep waters, whether the melting of those, um, of those ice sheets uh, perturb the ocean circulation system. In a sense, what happened in this red box and even more to the north of this red box um, where the blue water mass was actually forming and sinking out of the surface ocean to depth. So right, we will now shift to the Nordic Seas and look at that in, in greater detail. Uh, this is a picture um, of a glacier off, uh, on Svalbard. Um, you can see that, um, that 
Today, even there's, there's still remnant glaciers, but during the last ice age, Svalbard, Scandinavia, and Britain were, um, were covered with ice sheets, um, similar to what we find in, in Greenland today. So this study um, was done by Christina Larkin, my, my former PhD student. Um, so Christina, wanted uh, her PhD was was focusing on the Arctic and um, half of it she was looking at how neodymium comes out of the rocks um, into the sediment into the meltwater that comes out of glaciers and how that enters the ocean so kind of a chemical study of the input of neodymium to the ocean and you could see Christina here um, sampling um, some of those waters and and trying to understand what sets the neodymium isotopic composition of the ocean. Um, but the other part of it was measuring cores from throughout the, uh, throughout the Nordic seas um, and trying to reconstruct um, what happened during the last ice age and then during the melting of these massive ice sheets um, during the deglaciation from about 20,000 years ago to 10,000 years ago. Um, Christine is now a postdoc uh, at the National Oceanographic Center in Southampton. Um, and uh, her, her thesis work looking at past changes in ocean circulation actually was, um, was, was published in this Nature Geoscience article last week. Uh, so very a good time to, to actually give this talk. Um, so some of you might remember Christina, she was, um, she was an undergraduate um, at Murray Edwards. Uh, in fact, she studied natural sciences here, uh, and I remember interviewing her. Uh, she came back as a PhD student um, uh, to Murray Edwards as well. Uh, so it's, it's very rare to have a PhD supervisor and the, the lead author student um, to, uh, both from the same college, and so therefore we um, uh, perhaps a bit sentimentally um, decided to put Murray Edwards down as, uh, on our list of affiliations. Um, so why study the Arctic Ocean and Nordic seas? Well, as we saw before, the, the Nordic seas today is where we form the deep, um, dense waters that start this Atlantic overturning circulation. Um, so in a sense, the Nordic Seas is like the heart of this ocean overturning system. Uh, this is where those waters densify. And if we look at it in more detail, here we have Greenland to the east, Norway to the west, Svalbard up here in the north, and Iceland at the south. Uh, we could see that um, there's waters which are very cold coming out of the Arctic. Um, and they're mixing with these red water masses, which is the remnants of the Gulf Stream, um, which is very salty waters, which initially started very warm, but has released its heat to the atmosphere, has become colder. So we mix this very cold water with salty water, and therefore we get dense waters. And that happens at convection systems uh, throughout the Nordic seas, um, but especially it tends to happen near Svalbard itself. Also, uh, the high latitudes, the Nordic Seas and the Arctic, is particularly sensitive to climate changes. Um, and that's true today. Uh, that's true in the past as well. Uh, so I want to show a little film uh, which shows the amount of Arctic sea ice um, going from March to August in 2016. Our study area is to the, at the very top. Uh, between Greenland and Svalbard, which is right there. Um, you can see that the, the sea ice edge is kind of oscillating and moving around. Um, so obviously if sea ice is covering uh, the, the ocean, um, you can't form deep water. So it effectively acts as a lid uh, on convection in the ocean and formation of deep waters. Um, also when sea ice or, or, or glacial ice melt, it adds fresh water, which also acts as a lid to cap the ocean circulation system. Uh, so, so both the, um, the sea ice cover and the amount of melting can affect where and how much deep water you form. What did the Nordic seas look like during the last ice age? Uh, so this is a cartoon figure of what it may have looked like. 
Uh, back then at 20,000 years ago, there were big ice sheets um, covering Scandinavia, Britain, uh, Svalbard as well. Um, and the, the ice was actually extending as an ice shelf over the ocean. Um, and you probably had a lot more sea ice as well. Um, so we have these floating ice shelves um, and, and sea ice. And in fact, the picture of the, of the glacial ocean um, looks a lot like what's around Antarctica today. Okay, so in a sense, you can think of the, um, the glacial Arctic as analogous to the types of processes we have um, today off of Antarctica. Because we have this very cold ice sheet, we have catabatic winds, which are blowing um, from the center of it outwards, and that pushes sea ice away from the edge of the ice sheet um, and opens up areas of open ocean uh, called polynias. And in those, in those areas of open ocean, you can have heat basically uh, exchanged to the atmosphere. So we could lose um, heat and moisture due to evaporation um, to the atmosphere and cool down the surface waters um, and they could sink. Also, we have formation of sea ice. Uh, we have, anytime we have freezing of, of water, um, the sea ice and the ice doesn't have salt in it. So the salt gets left behind and basically that salt makes the surface water is more dense than they otherwise would be. Okay, so cold, once again, we, get, we have a propensity to get um, cold waters due to the exchange of heat to the atmosphere and dense waters because um, they're so salty due to the formation of sea ice, okay? So how did that um, affect ocean circulation? That's one question that we have. And then the other question is what happened when these massive ice sheets melted? Okay, so now we're looking at a movie of these massive ice sheets from 20,000 years ago to 15,000 years ago to 13,000 years ago. They're, they're basically melting away. Um, so a big change between the last ice age and our modern warm Holocene climate. And as that was happening, as we were melting those ice sheets, we were um, adding a large amount of fresh water, of melt water to the ocean. Um, and the question is whether that perturbed the ocean circulation system. And if it did, we should see changes at about 15,000 years ago to about 12,000 years ago as these ice sheets melted. Okay. Um, so we wanted to look at this with neodymium isotopes. We wanted to, first of all, see whether neodymium isotopes are a good way of tracing ocean circulation in this region. And the way to do that is to look at measurements of seawater today and to see how much variability there is. And it turns out, actually, this is a really good place to, to use neodymium isotopes. Um, because if you remember from the map I showed you before, Iceland is a volcanic is a volcanic area, so it has a very high neodymium isotopic composition. Greenland is very old crust, so it has a very low neodymium isotopic composition. Svalbard and, and Scandinavia also have distinct neodymium isotopic compositions. So our neodymium isotopes that are coming into this this kind of mixing pot or this heart of the ocean circulation are very different um, depending upon what, um, what area the neodymium is being added from, okay? So we have a lot of variability in a sense. Um, if we look on the left, we're seeing a transect right where this black bar is located. And we're looking right off of Svalbard, right where the deep waters are forming. And what we could see is at the top, this is the salinity of the water. So these are the different currents that are passing uh, through um, this, this um, in between Svalbard and Greenland. And below it is their neodymium isotopic compositions that were measured on seawater today. And what we could see is that at a very high um, sp spatial level, we can see details of those currents, right? Wherever we have these kind of red blobs, um, we see these blue blobs of neodymium isotopes. So what that's saying is that the neodymium, um, this chemical tracer is 
accurately tracing the physics of circulation today. Okay, and even some of the, um, the, the variability we see in the deep ocean spatially turns out to be um, seen by the neodymium isotopes as well. So then we have to go to the past, right? We need to take samples from different places and measure the neodymium isotopes on them uh, through time. Okay, and so this is this is something that Christina spent a lot of time in her first year of her PhD doing, which is visiting um, different oceanographic institutes, um, working with our collaborators on the paper to get um, to get these mud samples um, from throughout the Norwegian Sea. And I think this is what really made a big impact with the study, um, because at that point in time we only had the blue data points. Um, and what Christina added was all of these red data points, okay? Um, so you could see that she really filled in um, spatially, uh, both in terms of north and south, and also with depth in the, in the ocean as well, um, especially within the Nordic Seas. Um, and the Nordic Seas is where the deep waters are forming, right? That's where our waters are sinking out of the surface ocean into the deep ocean. So, basically what's shown by these aqua arrows here. Um, and so that's in a sense what we really um, want to see here. The other thing is we want to make sure that what when we extract the neodymium from the mud that we're actually matching the modern seawater composition. So we take mud from um, the, the very tops of the cores um, that we're working on uh, we measure the neodymium on those samples because those samples are basically modern. They were deposited within the last few decades or last hundred years or so. Um, we measure the neodymium that's preserved in the mud and we compare that to the modern seawater. And so um, we, were good, we were glad to see that actually um, for all of our mud samples, they were, um, they were really similar in terms of their neodymium to the modern seawater. Um, the modern seawater compositions. Of course, our, um, our resolution is not as good as the modern seawater, um, but, the, but the general pattern here um, is, is the same. All right, um, so we're gonna return now to looking at um, this Nord the Nordic Sea area. A key point within the system is the area between Svalbard and Greenland. It's an Arctic gateway in a sense. It's where a lot of the, um, the, the Gulf Stream waters mix with the Arctic waters and therefore sink. Um, and they sink in this region known as the Fram Strait, okay, between um, Svalbard and Greenland. And so it turns out that the, the waters that are entering from the Gulf Stream um, that, that are entering the Fram Strait have a composition about minus 10 um, to about minus 12. So that's in a sense, the starting composition of the surface ocean um, that's being carried down um, to depth today as our deep waters sink. So let's zoom in on this area and let's, and it turns out that we have three, we had three cores from this region. Um, we have, one from um, the, the blue core here, which is quite shallow and close to Svalbard itself. Um, we have um, a deeper core, which is in yellow, um, that's more in the Arctic area. And then the light blue core, um, which is, at a, is about 800 meters. So it's kind of in between uh, the two of them. And that's more in the, in the area where the Gulf Stream is. Uh, located. And so this is really the mixing pot where the Gulf Stream and the Arctic waters are mixing together. And this is where we think they're, they're sinking into the ocean. So now let's see what, the, um, what the, the sedimentary record, these cores have preserved through time in their neodymium isotopes. Uh, so using the same colors as on the map, we can, um, we can now look through time at what these three cores were we're preserving, okay? Um, today, we could see that the very tops of those cores, the modern sediments basically match the same composition of the waters which are entering this area at the sea surface, okay? 
Um, yet that signal is sinking down to a thousand meters, almost um, 3,000 meters depth in the ocean um, at all of, so we can see the same signature at all of these core sites. Um, so what that's saying is we could see this neodymium signature, um, this dye being carried with depth from the surface ocean to the deep ocean today. If we look back in time, we can see that during the last ice age, especially around 20,000 years ago, what we call the LGM or the last glacial maxima, actually we're seeing a very similar um, composition at all three sites. Um, it's different from today, it's about minus 13, um, but, it, but these three sites are also seeing the, a similar composition. And then what happens in between is this perturbation. Um, at all three of these sites, we see a change in the neodymium isotopic composition. It first shifts to be, um, to be um, um, something like minus eight or so, and then it shifts back up towards the modern composition. Okay, And it's really striking to get three cores at different depths. Um, and it turns out that these cores have different sedimentation rates as well. The blue core is accumulating sedi sediment really quickly at about 10 centimeters per thousand years. And the yellow core is um, accumulating sediments more slowly at four centimeters per thousand years. Uh, so to return back to our book analogy, we have three different books. Some of them are close to land, some are further to land. Um, some of them are shallower. Some of them are deeper, um, and some of them, the pages are turning more quickly, and others, the pages are turning more slowly. Um, but all three of them show the same story, um, which is that, um, that we, we, had, um, we had deep water formation happening during the last glacial maximum. Then we had a big perturbation when those ice sheets were melting at about 15,000 years ago, um, and then it slowly recovered at about 10,000 years ago, we reached the modern ocean circulation system. So that's kind of the starting point, right? We can trace our signature from the surface ocean to depth um, at these sites. But then as we move southwards um, away from Svalbard, along the flow of deep waters to the Northern Norwegian Sea, right about here off of Northern Norway, and we get this other core, which has this green record. And it looks, a, it looks similar to the cores off of Svalbard, but it's a little bit different. It's a bit noisier during the melt event. We still see this big change, right? Um, but then it becomes really noisy during the melt event. And it takes a bit longer to reach stable conditions um, during the Holocene. We could then move further south to the central Norwegian Sea. This core, which is split between blue and red here at the diamond, um, is in the central Norwegian Sea. And again, it starts off during the last ice age, really similar to what we see up in Svalbard and the northern Norwegian Sea. And it still sees this perturbation at about 16, 17,000 years ago when the ice sheets are melting, but becomes much more noisy. And in fact, it shifts back and forth for a longer amount of time until about um, 10,000 years ago, it, it kind of slowly drifts back towards um, the composition that we see today. So it looks like we almost have the signature that's added to the deep ocean near Svalbard, and then it's flowing southwards with the ocean circulation system. Um, and it's kind of being mixed away or attenuated. Uh, and it's becoming more noisy. Uh, probably because we have other inputs of neodymium uh, uh, that are coming in from Greenland and Iceland and Scandinavia. So in a sense, um, what we're doing here is we're, we're, we're tracing the circulation system kind of from the heart of, of the ocean circulation system through the main artery of flow from Svalbard southwards towards Iceland and into the open Atlantic. So we think about like how to really express this in the paper. And I, I think one way, uh, perhaps the most clear way of doing that is to kind of look at all this data together spatially through time, okay? So this is all of those cores that Christina measured. Uh, the last ice age, around 20,000 years ago or so, you can see there's not much variability. 
Today, there's not much variability. They all kind of plot on at the same isotopic composition. But during this period in the middle, um, we have a lot of variability um, as all these cores are doing their own thing. So he, the blue box is the last ice age. We bin this data 23 to 18,000 years ago. And so this is when we had those big ice sheets and a lot of sea ice around. Um, the orange data is the deglacial where we have a lot of melting and that's where we see a lot of variability and it's very incoherent chemically within the Norwegian Sea. And then the red data is today, uh, the late Holocene, the last 5,000 years. Okay, and it's a much more um, stable system. Uh, we can already see we go from stability in the blue to instability in the orange and then back to stability in the red. Um, so in the paper, we, we made a, 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 a diagram which kind of shows the, um, the, the amount of data at, at those neodymium isotopic compositions, right? So a histogram. Um, and so the red here is for the late Holocene. Uh, that's our modern ocean circulation system with all of these different rocks releasing neodymium to the Norwegian Sea. And then the ocean circulation system is effectively mixing those signatures together. Um, and that matches our modern seawater um, histogram. So if we look at the modern seawater today, it looks the same. We have the same composition on average and the same amount of um, variability in the basin. If we look at the, the, glacial, the, the glacial period, the last ice age, 23 to 18,000 years ago, um, the neodymium isotopic composition is different, probably because we have different rocks adding neodymium into the system. So the dye that we're adding is on average different, um, but you could see that the amount of variability in this histogram is the same as today. The ocean is very effectively mixing those different sources together. Uh, so there's not, there's not that much of a spread in the data at the time. But when we have the melting of those ice sheets between 18,000 years ago to 13,000 years ago, actually our data is all over the place. We have, um, we have compositions ranging um, from minus eight all the way up to minus 14. And so um, during, it looks like during that deglacial melting, even though we're adding all of this dye with different compositions to the ocean, um, it's not being homogenized so well. It's almost like the ocean was more stagnant at that point. And that makes sense because if you add, if you melt an ice sheet, you add fresh water, you basically cap the ocean with this water that's um, at the surface, it's not very dense. And so it doesn't want to sink into the ocean interior. Okay, and so the other way we, we, sh we, we show this is we made a movie of these changes through time. And maybe this is the best way to kind of see this. So I'll try and show it. What we're looking at is again, a side profile view of the ocean. To the right is in the north part of, off of Svalbard. And then to the left is going towards the central um, Norwegian Sea. And I'm going to skip ahead to about 20,000 years ago. So that's the last, this is the height of the last ice age. 20,000 years ago, it's very blue everywhere. It's very well homogenized, very, very well mixed. Now the ice sheets melt and it looks like the ocean circulation system slowing down and all of these different inputs that are coming in are not being effectively well mixed with each other. And then as the ocean recovers from that, um, we see that the, um, the colors become much more uniform, which means that the ocean circulation is doing a good job in mixing them um, together again. Um, and today we have a very well mixed, chemically well mixed ocean in that area. So once again, we're using chemical dyes in a sense to tell us about the physics of the ocean overturning system. So why might this be the case? Well, what it's saying is during the ice age, we had strong overturning circulation, which is somewhat surprising. Things were very different. We had um, big ice sheets, we had a lot of more sea ice around, we had a lot more stratification, um, but the, the Nordic Sea was very different, yet 
it seems like the ocean overturning was as strong. It was able to mix all of those different dyes together and give us homogeneous neodymium within the Nordic seas. So once again, we're looking at a cross section through the Norwegian Sea. This is what we think is happening. The Atlantic waters are flowing underneath the sea ice, underneath the shelf ice, um, and mixing with brines that are being released and therefore sinking into the deep ocean. And so um, it's a strong overturning circulation like today, like during the Holocene today, we have that happening, um, but we have open ocean conditions so the heat can be released. Um, so we have strong deep water formations today. We had strong deep water formation during the ice age as well. Um, but the reason for it is different. It's probably more related to brines uh, being produced. In either case, during the ice age, we had a strong, fast overturning circulation, just like today. What really sticks out is the transition between the ice age and the modern climate period. When we melted those ice sheets, um, we see a lot of instability in the system. Um, and we could see how long it lasts. Uh, we could see how long it takes to recover. Um, and that tells us about um, basically how the ocean could be perturbed um, and how it can then reach another um, state of stability. So our summary and conclusions is that, first of all, we can reconstruct the history of ocean circulation, which is a physical process, but using chemical tools. And those of you who study natural sciences in, uh, here in, in Cambridge at Murray Edwards will appreciate that bringing together of these different scientific fields. Um, and it's really nice to see these coherent changes at different sites that um, look similar. We can basically trace this pattern of change through the system. Uh, the Nordic Sea um, shows periods of both stability and instability. And that helps us to understand how ice melting influences ocean circulation. Um, during the ice age, like today, we saw a strong deep water formation here and um, the overturning mixed these chemical signatures even though the climate conditions were different. Um, but this stability was perturbed by ice melting and adding of fresh water at the end of the ice age. And we could see that this eruption lasted for a few thousand years um, before it reached a new, um, a new um, stable system. So this might be analogous um, to future melting of Greenland because the ice sheet on Greenland today is the last remnant of this, um, of this um, these, these great ice sheets that covered uh, much of the Northern Hemisphere during the Ice Age. Um, and if Greenland melts, we'll, we will probably see something really similar to what um, we've measured uh, in the past. So uh, I think I'll end the talk here and then uh, we can see if there's any questions. That's great. Thank you very much, Alex. It's really, really interesting. Um, can I invite people to put questions into the um, into the chat or into the um, Q and A section um, so that um, Alex can see them? Um, one one of the things I wanted to ask about you mentioned quite early on um, about speeding up the ocean circulation. Um, is is that something that's happening now? And if so, what is the likely um, how will that likely affect us living today? Yeah, there are some measurements that show that the ocean circulation, if anything, is, is probably slowing down um, over kind of yearly or decadal timescales. The problem is we don't have measurements that go back um, more than a few decades in time, um, but they do show um, actually an interesting amount of variability through time. Um, and they're, they're, uh, I've seen papers that say that there is that there's a trend towards um, towards slower, um, perhaps slower overturning in the ocean because um, you do have increased amount of meltwater coming off of Greenland um, at, the, at, the, at the current time. Um, so what, what effect that might have? Um, well, it's really hard to say. I mean, if, if you perturb the ocean circulation system enough and you stop the overturning, um, it, it basically, um, you stop releasing heat to the, uh, to the atmosphere. And it's thought that that would, plunge you into a colder period of time. Uh, so in a sense, you're slowing down the Gulf Stream, you're slowing down the release of that heat to the atmosphere that the Gulf Stream is carrying, um, and therefore you, you have colder conditions. So it's kind of counterintuitive. Um, you, 
you expect that if you melt more ice, you have warmer conditions, but it, the ocean kind of counteracts that and actually could, um, could shift you quite quickly to its colder conditions. And I think overall, it's more variability. Okay. Any questions? <clears throat> No, it doesn't look like people have got questions. Yeah. I did run over. All <laughs> of the data and statistics you've uh, shared with us. Yeah. It was good to see you, to see everyone. Just wait another minute and see if there's any other questions, but otherwise people are probably going to get dinner. Okay, can I just give people one more minute to put any questions in and, and if not, we'll say thank you and close the webinar. No. No. Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you, Alex. That was very, very interesting, very informative. And um, I'm sure if people have questions, they can come to you. Sure, they can always email me. me. So thank you, everybody. Um, have a good rest of your evening. Okay. I'm going to close it now. <laughs>